welcome everyone to today's presentation that Rocky Reaper and Cattle Plan are hosting together. Um, we've themed it Global Semen Adventures, which I'm sure has a lot of you intrigued. So hopefully throughout this presentation we'll explain it to you um, and take you on a trip around the world with us we can at the moment. Uh, my name is Alyssa Bishop and I'm the veterinarian at Rocky Repo. I've been there for just over a year now and I absolutely love it. I have been a vet for four years going on five um, and yeah, I'm really fortunate and thankful that I have been able to so early in my career focus on something that really interests me and hone in my skills. Hi everyone. Um, my name is Megan Brown and I'm the Northern Manager for Minitube Australia. So we distribute the cattle plan range um, of cattle repro hormones. My background is uh, cattle reproduction for the last 12 years, starting in um, IVF membrane transfer work and commercial AI and then moving over into the pharmaceutical space and doing trial work and that type of thing. So um, I've been with cattle plan now for just over 12 months. And, um, and I'll be joining a little bit later in the talk to cover a few different um, AI uses around the world. So I'll hand back over to Alyssa. So this presentation is being recorded, um, so you guys can watch it later. There is a Zoom link on the brochure somewhere. And for those listening online, if your audio drops out or you're not sure what's going on, we will send you the link later and you'll be able to watch the whole presentation again. Righto. So, who is Rocky Repro? For those that don't know, Rocky Repro is Queensland's leading bovine reproduction centre. We offer a lot of services, um, focusing mostly on cattle reproduction. So we can do bull collection in centre or on farm, semen testing for sales, herd use, um, AI, pregnancy diagnosis. Uh, we help with exporting semen and embryos overseas. And we are also help with other reproduction supplies, so we've got a lot of stock and um, hormones that we can help pass out, as well as plenty of advice. So, when you're travelling, you're planning where you're going to. So we've tried to sort of theme that whole travel trip planning throughout this presentation for you. So where Rocky Repro exports to is New Zealand, Canada and USA, Mexico, Paraguay, Argentina, Brazil and Colombia, um, Pakistan, Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia, and we're now in Africa, so we export to South Africa, Kenya, Zambia, and Namibia. So we send a lot of product around the world, which is great. Unfortunately, we can't send to China or the EU um, because they're declared as blue tongue free, and we do have blue tongue here in Australia. Um, but where we are here in Queensland, the strain that's up here is non pathogenic. So there is a strain that will cause symptoms in the cattle, but we don't see those symptoms. And extra little bit of interest for you, out of the 26 strains of blue tongue in the world, 12 are found in Australia. So we host a lot of blue tongue. Right, so we can import in from a few countries too. Uh, currently it's only the USA, Canada and New Zealand. Um, as with export, which I'll go through in a second, there is a lot of paperwork involved and it's critical that what we bring in is free of diseases that we've eradicated. No one wants to be at fault for bringing in foot and mouth or something serious. So, when we plan a trip to go overseas, we all see the doctor, we get our vaccinations, do all that sort of stuff. We plan where we're going to go, we pack. When we're at the airport, we then go to go through customs and we declare that we can travel. We then do our plane flight, all our travelling, and we sightsee. And the export process is actually very, very similar. So if we're going to export samples from a bull, the first thing that they have to do is pass quarantine and health testing. So on farm, hopefully you guys have got them up to date with all their vaccinations. They're all well and good. They come to us, and then we go through the isolation period and a whole bunch of tests. And this actually differs with each country that we're going to send to because they have different requirements um, from us to them as well as what they want to keep control of in their country. So once they've passed that, we then do the packing stage. So we collect our ejaculate from the bulls, we process that up and we put it in our straws and it goes in our tank 
ready to send over. We then have to go through a whole heap of paperwork, which is getting your tickets basically. So we need to talk with all the different governments and make sure that we have complied with their protocols. So we've got all the diseases ticked off that they wanted us to check for. We need to make sure that all the governments are happy with sending samples back and forth, that everyone's on the same page. Once that's done, we actually have a government official come and check the tank, make sure it's all good, that we haven't added extra stuff, that the sample we're sending it over is good. Because obviously this is a representation of Australia and we don't want to send it to something that's broken or poorly printed, things like that. Once that's all checked, it gets sealed and locked, like you do with your luggage, so no one else can add things to it. And then it goes on the plane. And this is where Sally sits biting her nails and waiting to hear that it's got over safely and we haven't had any dramas. Because on the trip there can still be issues, the wrong person might touch it, might go to the wrong port. And then we're going to start the whole thing over again and it's a big, big deal. Um, once it gets there, then we're all happy. And then yes, the semen can go sightseeing. It goes and gets dispersed to where it needs to. Sorry, I'll just admit someone else. So as I mentioned before, health testing is actually quite involved and it does change with every country. And unfortunately, these protocols aren't made and set in stone. As the diseases and viruses evolve, like we all know, Corona's been evolving, our protocols for importing and export evolves as well. So when a bull is there with us, we do a prep use wash to look for venereal diseases, because obviously we don't want to be sending that around the world. We take blood samples, and that assesses serum and whole blood. So when we send that to the lab, they can do cultures to grow different organisms. They can look for DNA to prove that the organism has been there. And they can look at the immune response to see if an individual has been exposed to a disease or a virus or not. And we can also do the same test on straws of semen that we collect. Um, all our blood samples that we take are taken on the same day as the ejaculate and we store them for later use. So that We've collected your bull, you didn't get any demand for your straws, but three months later you can, or you do get a, sorry, demand. We send those straws, but we're also able to still do health testing for that date and prove that the bull is declared free of those certain diseases. So there is a fair bit of extra stuff behind the scenes, and I'll just quickly run through this. It's a bit boring. Um, but what we've got to do is we've got to follow government guidelines. So this includes layout of the pens within Rocky Repro. So all the pens between export and domestic bulls need to be a certain distance apart. Sharing of water troughs and feed troughs, that's all we've got, certain regulations we have to follow with that. Um, all the equipment that we have has to be cleaned and disinfected a certain way. Once again, make sure we've got all our diseases cleared, everything's fine. Because we wouldn't want a domestic bull that's carrying something come through and pass it onto our export bulls because then unfortunately that means your bull can no longer have its sample sent overseas. Um, there's handling protocols with everything that we do in the lab, with all our gear that we wash up, even with bringing the bulls up and down the laneways, um, with people coming to visit bulls, there's very strict protocols we have to get you guys to follow. And we also need to record who comes on and off just for biosecurity as well. There is a tier of veterinarians. So as I said, I'm the vet for Rocky Repro, but I'm the on-site vet. So I'm the first port of call if something comes back in some blood test results or something happens to a bull. And then I report to Dr. Seth Wai, um, and he's got a wealth of knowledge and has been involved in this game for a long time and we can work together to resolve the situation. And also as part of us being accredited, each year we have government officials come and check out that all our protocols are up to date, that we are cleaning and doing everything properly, as well as coming and do those regular tape audits. So that also is a very stressful time. So just big things for us in terms of having that stress-free export trip. We just need to make sure that on-farm biosecurity for us and for you guys is all up to date. Um, that the bull comes on farm, as I said before, with all its vaccinations up to date. That just makes the health testing so much easier. Um, we need clear and constant communication with governments, not only in Australia, but all overseas. 
every bit of paperwork needs to be signed correctly um, and if a word is spelt wrong unfortunately that means you have to start the whole process again <laughs> and Sally's stress level skyrocket. <laughs> Um, and the other thing that's a big stress for us is making sure that that tank has enough nitrogen to make the trip to handle delays. So they're just little things that we have to deal with that don't impact you guys, but just so you're aware that it is a big thing. So we say we don't want the stress. Um, there's a group that I don't know if you guys have heard about called RG Tag. Um, they're called Ruminant Genetics Trade Advisory Group. And these guys are a group that take the concerns of the cattle industry take the demands of the overseas cattle industry to the government. Um, so both Sally and Dr. Ted Wise are on these committees. So if we're getting a sudden increase in demand from a country we haven't exported to before, they're able to, as part of this group, go to the government and say, right, can you communicate with this country so that our product that we want to sell on behalf of our client can go quite easily. And that way we can get protocols rolling, we can make sure that you know, your samples get over there nice and easily, no dramas. Um, and this committee actually exports or deals with the export of any germaplasm. So that's canine, ovine, caprine, all animal species. But I don't believe equal. So Rocky Repro first got accredited to export overseas in 2011. And then in 2012, we sent our first tank to Argentina. And since then, export has just gone crazy. So this, these graphs here um, have been taken from data collected by the government, and it is only up to August this year, so just bear in mind some of these trends have changed drastically in the last few months as corona restrictions have started to settle around the world. So this is how much bovine semen, so this doesn't take in all the other germplasm, this is just bovine semen that has been exported from Australia. So you can see there was a nice sort of incline and then we've sort of hit coronavirus and it started to decline. Out of Brisbane itself, which is where most of ours goes, um, there's a big increase and then a drop. Now this drop, incidentally, actually we've, guessing, now I'm not a statistician person, I can say it. Um, so don't take my word for it. But we basically sort of worked out that our demand from one particular country decreased in this time frame and it's made a significant change. Um, and once again, this is only to August this year. So the country that it's sent to is actually quite a range. So this is over six years, 2015 to 2020. Um, and this is from our own data. So it's actually a bit more recent than August. But as you can see, there's actually a big up and down in all the countries over their years depending on what they need um, and this other this other one covers these countries so Canada, Laos, Namibia, New Caledonia, New Zealand so they all sort of make up little bits and pieces within it but it is quite interesting to see how over the years the demand changes like in America, there was a big spike and it's dropped and it's spiked again. So something's obviously happened for them over there to change their demand. So this is by breed. And I find it very interesting that over the years, everything's changed. So one year, Drought Masters was overtaken the Brahmins. Sorry, guys. Um, but yeah, other breeds are quite um, desirable overseas. And these Wagyu's here are catching up. So it's going to be interesting to see how over the next couple of years how the different breeds compare. And then this last graph just accumulates all that data. So from 2015, which is not when Rocky Repo started exporting, that data was too hard to collate. <laughs> um, but since, yeah, 2015 to I think I went up to September, there has been 43,560 straws of Brahmins sent overseas around the world from Rocky Repro. So I don't know what countries they went to. Well, I do, but I don't have that data here. Um, and then droughties weren't too far behind. And yeah, there's a few other breeds. So just interesting to show you that there is a lot of other breed demand around the world. And yeah, to look at the data and see where it's going is quite interesting. Um, but now that we know Rocky Repro sends so much product overseas, Let's find out what it gets used for. 
Thank you, Alyssa. Um, so with, as she touched on, um, our genetics go to a lot of different places around the world. So I wanted to cover off um, just some of the, give, give you a picture of some of the places that use our genetics, what they do with it and the reasons why they, why they do it. Um, so firstly, I'll just give a bit of a background on who we are. So you know, we're Minitube and um, cattle planner. So Minitube is a family owned German um, animal reproduction company and we've been working in animal reproduction for over 50 years. Uh, we look after horses, dogs, cattle, sheep, pigs, fisheries, all kinds of things. So any kind of animal reproduction we, we do. It. Um, we manufacture reproductive products and training tools. So we work with universities, vets, farms to deliver the training. And we also um, recently acquired the cattle plan range of reproductive hormones for AI from Syntex in Argentina. So when you see cattle plan, that's our uh, repro hormone range and many shoes is the company that's distributed here in Australia. Uh, this is our head office in Germany, it's a bit greener than it is here. And we have, or many shoes have offices in lots of different countries around the world, South America, Central, Canada, um, Europe, Russia, Middle East, Asia, lots of different places. Um, we also produced the first automatic semen freezing machine. So that's the very first one many moons ago. And now they look a little bit different. Um, that's where we're at now with the different computer programs we've got and straw printing and freezing systems. Um, Syntex, who produced the cattle repro hormones, distribute to 32 different countries around the world for the cattle repro. And as you can see, including Australia, all through South America, Canada, um, Africa, Europe, some Middle East as well. And this is probably what you might be familiar with here in Australia. These are the two progesterone devices for AI synchronisation or ET. So the Dib H, which is mostly used in beef, and the Dib V, which is mostly used in dairy foods. Um, they're just a bit different dose rates, so that's why they sit in different markets. So when we talk about others using fixed time AI, there's a lot of different reasons they do it, but they pretty much align with what we do here and the same reasons. So firstly, the biggest thing is time management. If you're wanting to use uh, fixed time AI, often it eliminates heat detection, so you're not out watching cattle during the day. It also tightens up joining seasons quite well, which um, helps with labour planning, um, pasture management, and lots of different things down the track. They also use it for genetics, obviously if you're importing semen from, from Australia, you're wanting to get different genetics from somewhere, so you can look at genetic gain and bring in new bloodlines. Um, yeah, changing calving patterns, also to improve breeder body condition. So when they're front loading the breeding season with an AI program, they're going to be calving into better nutrition as well. So those breeders aren't going to drop off as much in condition um, after calving, which helps their rebreeding rate in the long run. Um, and in certain different, depends what your market is, it's quite cost effective um, to be doing your fixed time AI prior to putting bulls out in the paddock. And in your dairy systems too, when you're joining at the beginning of the season, those cows are going to be calving early, so there's more days in milk. So a lot of um, numbers around that range is between seven and twenty dollars a day for an empty dairy cow. So if you've got a lot of them, it adds up pretty quickly. Um, this is just an example in Brazil of breeding better beef. They're crossbreeding Nello just for the beef quality with Euro breeds, and that's the the outcome. I also thought I'd put together a few numbers just to show you what, or to have a look at what Australia compares like on a global scale with cattle numbers, um, with semen doses sold, and so you can see where that AI market sits. Um, it's a little bit hard to read there, but I'll read it off here for you. So Africa has 22% of the global cattle population. Um, Oceania, Australia, New Zealand and the islands down here is 2.4%. Um, then we have Europe at 8.3%, um, Asia at 31.9%, so Asia has the biggest population of cattle. North America has 7%, 
South America has 22.4% and Central America is 4%. So that's just an overview of um, the law of the cattle market. So where does that fit into Australian beef production? So that previous one was just all cattle, now this is just looking at beef. Um, I have to apologise, these are in Spanish, I took it out of the Spanish presentation, but these are all the countries on the left hand side of your screen there. So you can see here that South America sits at the top, for, and this is the number of cattle, so number of head of beef cattle. So this is 359 million beef cattle in South America, 24.4% um, of the global population. And when we look at Australia down here, um, you see we sit these numbers from 2016. So this has changed and in Australia it's dropped a little bit, but we sit at 24 million down here, so 1.7% of the beef market. When we look at um, the amount of beef actually turned off, you see South America's up here is 15 million tonnes of beef, 22.9% of the market. And Australia is down here at 2.36 million tonnes. But then once we have a look at the next part of it, which is the price we get for our beef and the quality of the beef, it changes a little bit. So South America is, which is on these numbers, this is 236 cents a kilo, and we are up here at 258. So that is generally the trend and it still is that our beef, which is a higher price and the quality is better, but the volume is a lot less, so that's the difference in the market. So I'll give you a bit of a look at each market that we've talked about. So in, um, in Argentina, there's 17 million females that are bred six times in a every year. And this is what the Argentinian semen market looked like between 2001 and 2015. So the total number of semen doses sold is in yellow, so it sits at about just over 6 million. Um, and then the dairy one is a little bit higher than beef, as you would expect. Uh, this just looks at those numbers a little bit closer. So this is the number of semen doses used each year. The number of, and this is the number of those doses used in fixed time AI programs. So there's been a trend over time that the use of fixed time AI has increased when compared to heat detection AI programs. And that just comes back to some of those reasons we looked at earlier with timings and, um, and different market um, opportunities for different properties. This is the percentage growth over time down the bottom. Of, so it's 355% growth in the semen market, but it's over a thousand percent growth in the actual fixed time AI market. And you'll see some of these are over 100% and that's because it's a resynchronous program. So sometimes we're doing a couple of AIs at a time. The newer data from 2016 and 17 follows this trend as well. So it's gone up from 2.4 million doses up to 3.2 in 2017. And that's some of the latest data we've got out of Argentina. Um, from the Syntex database, so where all the cattle plant hormones come from, we have a database of about 431,000 fixed time AI programs. And in that, um, the average pregnancy rates when you combine beef, dairy, everything all together is 50.39%. That's just across the board globally. Um, obviously, there's variation in that between 10 and 82%, and that just comes down to semen handling, preparation of cattle, um, AI tech, all kinds of things can impact that sort of thing, nutrition, lots of things. When we split that out a little bit further by breed, so your British breeds have a higher average percent pregnancy rate for AI, and your indicative English cross breeds have a, a little bit lower, and that's a global thing as well. When we look at different categories of cattle, we've got wet cows, these are all averages as well. This is your wet cow average percentage. Um, cows that have been early weaned, so they're joining quite close to calving. Um, dry cows, younger heifers, and then older heifers. That, that gives you an idea of averages across the different classes. Um, this is an example of a farm in Argentina where they've been doing um, fixed time AI in the stud and commercial cattle. So these guys run 2,600 stud cows and heifers and then 5,000 commercial head. 
And this is data from the last or for 10 years worth of AI programs on this particular problem. They started in 2000, it runs in 2010, and in that time they AI 23,050 cattle. Um, and the overall pregnancy rate averaged for that <coughs> 55%, which haven't altered drastically throughout that whole time. So it's been pretty consistent, just to give you a picture of what they do. This shows you some of the reasons as to why they utilise fixed time AI. This farm in northwest Argentina, um, it's sort of like um, northwest Gulf Country type area, and their aim was to improve weaning weight, so they used AI for that reason. This is their range by month, so it's a little bit similar to us. Um, they're quite seasonal, and this is what it looks like in the dry season coming into summer, and um, so it's sort of like that down country a little bit. And then when it does rain, it's really good country. What they found was when they used the fixed time AI with the mop up all afterwards, and then compared it to just having bulls out in the paddock, the average weaning weights are quite different. Um, so overall, the fixed time plus bull versus this one, there was a 28%, oh, sorry, 28 kilo on average per animal increase in weights just because you're utilizing. Um, Better genetics, if they're being born at the earlier time of the season, so they're getting better nutrition, they're just bigger, um, bigger calves as well. These are just some photos of what the facilities look like in Argentina. This is pretty typical wooden yards they have, um, and wooden crushes too. That's one of them. Um, that's a set of yards that I would set up in northern Argentina. And some of them are, some of them have got covers, some have temporary covers. Uh, some of them have crushes a bit similar to ours, but crushes. And then we'll have a look at Brazil. So they're a little bit different again. They're a very massive big market. Um, for fixed time AI, 110 million females. This is the AI market in Brazil at the moment. So from 2002 to 2016, the overall number of AI is the red line, it's been growing. The blue line here, that's the detection AI program, and your green line is fixed on AI. So there's a trend um, in those production systems, they're moving away from heat detection and more into fixed time. And that can also be because Osinicus animals are notoriously um, known for having a lot more silent heat, so they are harder to heat detect too. And sometimes some of your most fertile animals too, you're missing them come on heat. So that's why there's been more of a shift to fixed time also than heat detection. These are some of the facilities in Brazil. Um, it's a nice new crash. Uh, doing some AI work, but because the numbers are so big, their speed is amazing, so they can AI a cow a minute um, in some of the bigger places. This farm in Brazil um, wanted to change their carving distribution. So they went from bulls in 2005 to fixed time AI in 2006 in 5,500 wet cows. And they just wanted to shift that distribution around. This is how they managed their, their field model. So this is how they managed their wet cows during their AI program. They counted the calves off and then they just tailed them around to the paddock after the program. What they were aiming for in this is that the cows were enrolled into a fixed time AI program 30 days after calving. Then on day 49, which was after the synchronization, they all were AI. The bulls were then put in the paddock 10 days later with those cows. And on day 75 post calving, 37 days after the start of the breeding season, they did a preg test to follow up on that round of AI and the bulls in the paddock. So they then from that they compared the 2005 and 2006 season. Um, the 2000, I'm oh sorry, the conception rate to the AI program in those cows was 50%, or just over 50%, and the first cycle after the fixed time to the bulls picked up 18.2%. So overall, within um, 37 days into the breeding season, they had a 68.7% pregnancy rate in that 5,500 head of cattle. Uh, and as you can see, it, it changed the distribution of the calving quite significantly. So the red 
the red bars here are from 2005, um, and that was the shape of their carving. And in 2006, the season was front loaded with the AI and the ball again. So it really tightened up and changed the shape of their head. Some of the other uses in South America fixed on AI is resynchroning. So they'll do several rounds of AI back to back for a really tight carving window. Uh, this trial was looking at Nello cattle. Um, they did three rounds of fixed on AI. And that was in about 80 days, so less than three months. And the pregnancy rate for each round was 59, 62, and 41. So within that 80 days, they ended up with a 91.6% pregnancy rate in a very, very tight window. So that's something that um, a few herds do if they're moving, say, from a year round joining pattern into a, a more controlled window. They might do this intensively for a couple of seasons until they get that window they want, and then they might move back to one round of AI just to keep that flowing. Um, fixed one in Mexico, this is a big Mexican dairy that they use it in. Um, other uses, they obviously have beef and dairy programs there. They use single fixed time and they resync programs in the dairies. It's really good for non cyclers so the ones that aren't cycling up to carving with that massive lactational stress. They go through an AI program and it can kickstart them cycling a bit earlier than what they would naturally. And also to eliminate heat detection, so it just takes that, um, that fact out of it. Particularly in those high producing dairy cows, um, some of them, their heat times can be one or two hours long, so they're really easy to miss, and yet they're some of your most productive cows, so you want them in your herd. And so doing fixed time helps you pick those up easier than heat detection. Um, this was just an example of that. There was a trial done in this dairy where they looked at heat detection using a three injection program versus a fixed time AI program and a resync with the progesterone device and all of the hormones. And there was a 10% difference in the pregnancy rates between heat detection and fixed time AI, and there was no balls involved or watching cattle. So that was the difference between those. Um, some massive big dairy system there. The fixed time in Japan, it's similar. The Japanese market's not as big, but um, they use it for the exact same reason, genetic gain, production gain, non-cyclers in dairies. Um, the dip was just registered in Japan too, so that's dip in Japanese. Um, and this is a picture of the Japanese, the number of Japanese fixed time AI programs they've done every year. So it's growing. It's not a massive big market, there's 45,000 here, but it is, it's growing as well. Uh, when we look at South Africa, once again, they're wanting to tighten joining windows, front loading the breeding season. Um, this is done in extensive beef herds and also intensive herds and dairies. They use resync um, and the cattle plan index range has been on the market there for two years now. They've got a lot of Bonsmara cattle that they work with and, and Brahmins too. Um, this is just a picture of some of the yards, so they're not exactly the best crushes in some situations and um, I just give you another look at some of the ones my work. So this is this is the product market since Syntex have entered the, the market over there and how it's increased. So some products have only been on the market for one year, I've been on the market for two. As you can see, the one these couple have been on the market for two years and they're growing um, as the technology becomes more popular as well and is growing. Um, Paraguay is a, a market that Poppy Repro work with a fair bit, and they use fixed time AI, ET, IVF in their herds, um, reducing cost of breeder management, looking for more even lines of cattle, and tightening up the joining season. So these are some ET recipes in their calves um, in Paraguay, and them just doing transfers and that's what their cattle yards look like. Um, so, on to Australia. So in Australia we use fixed time AI and both in the northern and southern market uh, for beef and dairy, intensive, extensive, stud and commercial. And some of the main reasons once again are the same. Genetic gain, um, heavier weight gain, earlier weight gain, shifting carving patterns around, um, measuring the pasture, uh, sorry, better management of pastures too, so you can carve at certain times and improve nutrition of the animals. 
um, and looking at that breed of body condition too, so calving them at a certain time when they've got decent feed. And also better beef and more milk. So we've done work in southern Angus herds, um, in northern Brahmin crossbred herds, beef, uh, stud and commercial. We've done veterinary training sessions up here in Queensland. Um, we're doing trial work in Queensland here too. And this is some of our dairy trial work down in Victoria. Um, the growth for the cattle plan range here in Australia over the last five years has drastically increased. Um, you will notice there's a dip there in 2019 and that was um, distributors changed over for 12 months. So there was a dip in the market there. And, but it's yeah, on the way up again. And I was just going to finish with a bit of a interesting story from when I was in Argentina a couple of years ago on a really nice way that this family company um, has utilised Six Time AI to meet their business needs. So this um, this particular property is in the north of Argentina, near Brazil and Paraguay, up in the top corner. Um, the countryside is a bit like sort of Ingham, probably is the best way to describe it, comparing it to Australia. And they breed um, stud and commercial Braford. A lot of their genetics come from here, and they are mostly bull breeders for the market over there. So when they use six time AI initially in about three rounds of breasting to really tighten up their breeding herds. And they did that for a number of years until they got the system and the timings in place that they wanted. Now they only use one or two rounds of six time AI, depending on what they want. And they separate their, their groups out, they separate wet cows, first harvest, and heifers into different mobs. Um, they also early wean all of their cows. Their body condition is better for rebreed. They early wean them at about three months of age onto pasture, but they're also supplemented with a bit of grain. Um, all of the grain is actually grown on farm as well, on their own farm. And um, there's multiple different types of crops that they grow. One of them though is, um, is rice. They, because they're up near Brazil, they've got massive big river systems that put down to shame, and so they have flood irrigated rice paddies. And they use biological control for all the parasites and pests in there with a species of native fish called Paku. So the Paku are in amongst the uh, rice paddies. And those Paku fish are also grown on farm in their own fishery, and they've got singling out each year. And those fish are then pro, um, processed and packed into their own brand on farm in their own fish um, fish avatar and packing facility, um, which is all then exported out of their own port because they've got big river systems, they have their own ports at their farm. So they can export their cattle, their fish, their grains, everything from the same place. They also have a restaurant in town where all the fish is sold through. And all of the byproduct from the fish production, the cropping um, beef goes into their own brand of dog food, which is also produced on farm in their own factory and exported out of their ports. So the reason they use fixed time AI is so that their cattle can fit in with their grain production, can fit in with their fish, can fit in with everything else to produce um, their whole business plan on farm. So it's just a an extreme example, but it's a very interesting, interesting example. So, so that's um, that's pretty much it. That's the overview for us. And if you've got any questions, feel free to fire away. <laughs> oh, good, <laughs> very good. No, we think yes. Section, yep. So there's it's a difference of numbers with fixed time. So um, with fixed time AI, if you have a 50% pregnancy rate, and say in 100 cattle, just because it's a simple number, you will have 50 calves. If you do heat detection, it depends how well that herd is cycling. Natural peace is often more fertile, but often a smaller percentage of the herd will be cycling at a set time than they would be if you're doing fixed time. So 
for example, if you have a 60%, um, sorry, 50% cyclicity rate or that herd, and you get 50% pregnant with heat detection in that same 100, you'll get 25 calves. Um, if you did the fixed homeowate, it's 50 calves. But it's just, it's a matter of numbers and time. So the fixed homeowate is good because it, it's tight and it's timed. Um, it also depends what, there's a lot of variables. It depends what your market is. It depends what your business goals are. It depends what your facilities are like. Can you heat detect? Um, in, it depends what breed you have too. So, Bosinicus are harder to heat detect than Bos Taurus cattle. That's it, yeah. That's it. And the other thing with, with fixed time programs is that you, um, cattle go through. Um, they go through a period called uterine involution after they calve. So it's 30 days where they can't do anything. They can't breathe, can't do anything. Um, depending on their body condition, their nutrition and all of that coming out of it um, determines how long post that time they'll start cycling again. Um, if they're on a forward plan of nutrition and if they're past that sort of 30 odd days calving, as long as they're going forward in decent body condition, you can enrol them into a fixed time AI program to start them earlier than they would come on um, naturally. So you can use that to tighten up those windows as well. Um, it's not that the, uh, your overall pregnancy rate at the end of the season may be different. It's the time frame when they're when they're getting pregnant. Yeah. Yep, yeah. so if you um, put them into a resync program like that, uh, we, some of the programs we've worked with, 16 days after they've been AI the first time, you can start setting them up again. And um, day 32 after the first fixed time, so it's 42 days, you get your second AI in. And so, for example, that farm that was doing three, they could get three rounds in under 80 days, um, for about 80 days. Yeah. So. The, no. So there's there's all different products that you use in resynchrony programs, and it, some products obviously can cause abortions and things, but some are safe to use at certain time points, even in pregnant cattle. So the recent programs that are used um, utilise those products that are safe to set them up around that 16 days post AI. Then by the time you get to day 30, um, you can do an early pregnancy scan at day 30. And what's not pregnant then is when you can start using what you would normally use in a program um, and resetting up those empty cattle and the AI two days later, so 32 days post the first time. Um, so that's a good question. <laughs> it's a very good question. So when you set a time here, yes. what do you think you can make it? Do they say it's short of the time or what Yep, so a silent heat can be when they don't show um, heat behaviours, generally, um, or they show them for a shortened period of time. Yeah, sometimes they don't show them at all, but they still have ovulated. And that ties back to what's happening on their ovary and how what their hormones are doing from their brain and their ovary. And if they're in poor body condition, um, if they're nutritionally stressed or if they're high producing, like the high lactating dairy cows or something like that, um, it, it changes their metabolism, it changes how their hormones are produced. So when that happens, um, it also changes how much they behave and um, it doesn't necessarily stop them ovulating, but it can suppress all those secondaries behind. Yes, that's right. Yep. Yep. So when you're doing things, um, if you're heat detecting and you miss those, then that's something that you could pick up in a fixed time program. Um, so you can get different percentages that way. Yep. We do have various programs that will be AI programs that will have in our store. So if you wanted to touch us further about the resources, different ways that you want to program for your property. Some have a chat that we can talk through that and talk about the different ways of incorporating each section or doing all fixed time programs. And there's some programs
programs too that use both. So some of them will um, incorporate heat detection and fix time. Um, there's lots of different combinations and it just comes down to what suits your farm, what suits your herd and what suits your business management goals for your particular property. So um, but everyone is different, that's why there's not sort of one size fits all. Everyone has different requirements. So but please guys can help you with that. <laughs> so have come in the chat to us this week. Yeah, very good. We thank everyone for coming today and everybody that's joined us online as well. Thank you for coming along and we'll send this out to everybody that's registered. Um, if you haven't yet registered and you do want a copy, then um, the link is actually on the Rocky Repros page. You can put your name down and we can send it to you. Um, but we'll be here next week. And a big thank you to those who gave us the slides for uh, yes. Yep. Thank you very much. <laughs>